In this video, I want to explain what is meant by a posterior predictive check, and I want to talk about why, in general, these are useful things to do. In fact, I would probably rephrase that. I would say that these are a vital part of fitting any model, is to undertake posterior predictive checks. So firstly, a posterior predictive check relies on us being able to approximate the posterior predictive distribution. And whilst there is an equation which would allow you, if you could undertake the calculations, to exactly calculate the posterior predictive distribution. In most practical circumstances, this calculation is just too difficult to undertake. So what is the posterior predictive distribution? Well, it is the probability distribution over a new data sample, x tilde, given a current data sample, x, given that we've observed x. How do we approximate this distribution in practice? Well, the idea is that we iterate the following two steps. Firstly, we draw a value of theta i from our posterior distribution. Then what we do is we draw a value of x tilde i from the sampling distribution, which is conditional on the value of theta i that we've just drawn. And the idea is that we repeat each of these steps many, many times. And if we draw a histogram of x tilde, then that gives us an approximation to our posterior predicted distribution. And each of these steps represents the two sources of uncertainty. Firstly, we have uncertainty over the parameter value, that's the first step, and then secondly, we have uncertainty over the data generating process, which is the second step. So the idea with posterior predictive checks, which we often abbreviate PPCs, is that we compare our actual data sample, x, with our distribution of all the different values of x tilde that we've generated. So we have x tilde 1, x tilde 2, etc, etc, all the way up to x tilde n. And the idea is that if our model is fitting the data reasonably well, then these fake samples that we've generated from our data generating process should encompass the true data that we observed. In other words, it shouldn't look too different from the true data. So the idea is that if they do compare, then that looks like the model fit is OK. Else, then we need to make some change to our model. But importantly here, I've been very vague about what I actually mean by comparing the data with our fake data. And the reason I'm being vague here is because really there are an infinite number of ways you can compare your actual with your fake data. And as to what the right choice of comparison should be, it depends very much on the use of your eventual model or what you're wanting your model to actually achieve. I now want to provide a very simple example of undertaking a posterior predictive check. And the example here is going to be that we're going to be counting in a given time period i, the number of cars which pass a given point on the road. And let's imagine that each of these time periods corresponds to the same time of day, but carried out on different days. So we have a count variable, and we might suppose that a simple model, if we imagine that the arrival of one car is independent of another one, is to model xi as coming from a Poisson distribution with some rate parameter lambda. And if we assume that lambda comes from a gamma distribution with some parameters that I'm not going to specify here, then because the gamma distribution is conjugate to a Poisson prior here, we can calculate the posterior, which will also be a gamma distribution, just with different parameters to the prior distribution. I should say that none of this example hinges on the fact that we have a conjugate prior here. It just makes the maths a bit easier to follow and hopefully it makes it easier to understand what exactly I'm doing in the simulations that I'm going to show. So what we do here to generate the posterior predictive distribution is we first of all sample a value of lambda i from our posterior distribution. Then what we do is we sample a value of xi from a Poisson distribution which is conditional on that value of lambda. And the idea is that we iterate both of these two processes and we can look at the values of xi tilde that we draw out. 
And so what I'm going to do in the simulations is I'm going to first of all look at the true histogram of the data that we collect and I'm going to show that in blue so that will look something like this say and then what we do is we draw out data samples from our posterior predictive distribution which are of the same size as the original data so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw out many many more histograms I'm not going to draw all of them here and we're going to compare in each of the cases, the maximum value of our simulated data, so in both of these cases that would correspond to these values here, with the maximum value from the real data, which would be here. And if our fake data maximum value exceeds that of the real data, then we're going to color that histogram green, otherwise we're going to color it in orange. And what we're going to do is we're going to repeat this process many, many times. And what that's going to allow us to do is to calculate what is known as a Bayesian p-value, which is the probability that some summary statistic in the fake data exceeds some summary statistic in the observed data. And the idea with this Bayesian p-value is that if it is somewhere near 1, or alternatively if it's somewhere near 0, then that's telling us something about a model misfit. Because what that is meaning is that in both of those cases, both of those extreme, either near 1 or near 0, our observed data is in the extrema of our fake simulated data. And so our fake simulated data isn't looking very much like our real data. So now I want to illustrate this process using some simulated data in Mathematica. So suppose that the real data we observe is shown here in this blue histogram. Then what we're going to do is we're going to simulate a load of fake data samples from our posterior predicted distribution, and we're going to compare those fake data samples with the real data sample. And so in the top left here, I've got the real data sample, and I've indicated as a blue dotted line the position of the maximum value that we actually obtained in our real data. And so this is the maximum number of cars that passed a given point on the road at a given point in time. Then, across all of the other histograms, I've got fake data samples that I've generated from my posterior predictive distribution. And in each of the cases, I have coloured the histograms according to whether the maximum value of the fake data sample exceeds the actual value. And so we can see that there are some three cases here where the fake data sample maxima actually exceeds the maximum we see in our data, whereas there are many, many others where this wasn't the case. And I should say that this is a stochastic process. So the idea is if I drew new posterior predictive samples from my posterior predictive distribution, then I would obtain a different set of histograms. And here I've only found that one of them has fake data whose maxima exceeds the real data maxima. So the idea with posterior predictive checks is that you carry out this process of comparison many, many times. And then you compare across all of your posterior predictive samples, all of your fake data samples that you've generated, you see how often the summary statistic in your simulated data exceeds that in the actual data. And what we see if we carry out this process many, many times here, I've done it 10,000 times, is that only in about 5% of the time does my simulated data maximum exceed the real data maximum. So what does this tell me? It tells me that it's quite unlikely that we would generate extremes that we see in the real data with the data generating process that we're using. And so to me, this doesn't seem like necessarily a very good fit of the model. And this sort of model misfit would be particularly important if the model was being used to plan for extreme circumstances. So for example, imagine that the model is being used to plan, say, the number of police that we need to be out on the roads when there is a lot of rainfall. I should say that the cutoff for what you consider acceptable is somewhat arbitrary. It depends on the eventual use of the model. But to me, if we're only replicating the real data characteristic 5% of the time, I wouldn't have that much confidence in using this model to predict new data. What is the likely cause of our model not being able to recapitulate these extremes that we see in the data? Well, it's likely that it's because of the fact we're using a Poisson distribution here, 
to describe our data. And we might be better off replacing the Poisson with a more overdispersed distribution, for example, the negative binomial. And this also makes sense theoretically for our particular example, because one of the assumptions in using the Poisson distribution here is that the arrival of one of the cars is independent of the arrival of another car. And we know in practice that that's not likely to be the case. If, let's say, there's a rainfall, that means that there tend to be more cars on the road than there would otherwise. And so knowing that there is one car that's passing the point will tell you that it's perhaps more likely that another car will also pass the point. And a negative binomial distribution does not assume independence in events, unlike the Poisson. And so we might think that it's a better distribution to use anyway. So in summary, posterior predictive checks are a way of checking the fit of your model to data. And it is essential that whenever you fit a model to data, you carry out posterior predictive checks. The way in which these checks are done depends on the circumstance. And it pays to be really creative and to really think about what particular characteristic you want to compare between the real and the fake data. And that characteristic should depend on the eventual use of the model.